Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne and Tracy Miller. It's July 15, 2002. Five-year-old Samantha Runyon is playing with a friend in her front yard in Stanton, California. A man approaches and asks the girls to help find his lost dog. He then grabs Samantha and forces her into his car. A day later, Samantha's lifeless body was spotted by hang gliders in the Cleveland National Forest. She'd been sexually assaulted, strangled, and staged. The sheriff promised the perpetrator on national television, you can't run, you can't hide, we're going to find you. They did just that. Welcome to Behind the Crime Scene, where we take you beyond the yellow tape and into the lives of first responders, investigators, and prosecutors who work true crime. I'm Gina Osborne, retired FBI Assistant Special Agent in Charge and former Army Counterintelligence Agent. And I'm Tracy Miller. I've been a prosecutor for over 23 years, prosecuting some of the most violent criminals, including gangs, juvenile sexual assault, and domestic violence cases. Over the next three episodes, we're going to be talking about the 2002 abduction and murder of five-year-old Samantha Runyon. Not only will we be speaking with lead prosecutor David Brent, who successfully prosecuted child predator Alejandro Avila for this horrific crime, we'll also be speaking with Samantha's mother, Erin Runyon, to hear how she coped with this tragedy and used her daughter's story to teach others to be brave. Tracy, let's start with Dave. Dave has had an incredible career. He was a prosecutor for over two decades in the Orange County District Attorney's Office, and he had several very successful high-profile cases that had media coverage. He spent his career trying sexual assault and violent murder cases. After his successful career as a trial attorney, he then became the managing prosecutor of the Orange County District Attorney's Homicide Unit, where he guided homicide lawyers in prosecuting their cases. Dave is very special to me, Gina, because he was my boss in the DA's office. I was on a team which is called Felony Panel, which is your garden variety felonies, where as a prosecutor, you learn how to try some more difficult cases with complex issues. And Dave was the assistant manager of that unit, and that's where I became close to him and learned so much about how to try a case from him. And this case was quite a case. I'll never forget it. I mean, we both worked in Orange County during this time, and the Samantha Brunyan case is just a case that ripped your heart out. I think it really made me realize that there is true evil out there. Well, let's go behind the crime scene with Dave Brent on the Samantha Brunyan case. It's nice to have Dave on the show, Gina, because he was my boss when I did felony panel, which is the time when you actually learn how to do felony cases um, and become what we call a real trial lawyer. Great. And Dave coached me through several cases, one in particular where I thought I couldn't win. And he's like, you take that to trial. You can win it. And of course, I got a five minute verdict. Oh, wow. (laughs) (laughs) So tell us, Dave, um, you've tried so many cases and, and many, many cases that were in the media and in the press and so many homicides. But we wanted to ask you today about the Alejandro Avila case. Can you tell us what you remember about that crime? That crime took place, the murder of Samantha Running took place in the summer of 2002. It was, the actual date of the murder was July 15th. There had been, at that time, a heightened sense in the Amer- among the American public because of some very high-profile child abductions that took place leading up to Samantha. I think it was in February that Danielle Van Dam had been kidnapped and murdered down in San Diego, and that became quite a case in the media. And then the month before Samantha was murdered was when Elizabeth Smart was kidnapped. Right. And everyone presumed that she had been killed. I thought she had been. Of course, we learned many years later that she had not been, but there's a lot of fear among people and a lot of kind of, you know, thinking about children. And so... um, uh, Samantha is basically living in Stanton, was in a condominium complex, playing with uh, her little friend, uh, Sarah. And Samantha is five, but almost six. I think her birthday was at the end, it was, it was the end of July. So she had not quite reached the age of six. 
they're playing and somebody playing with the ball and a man drives up near to where they're at. They're at. There's sort of these kind of like these side streets within the condominium complex. And the man says, have anybody seen a puppy? And Samantha, with her hands, motions sort of the, the size of what a little puppy would be. I think she said words to the effect of, you know, you mean like this? And the man jumped out and grabbed her and threw her in the car. Wow. And so Sarah goes and tells Samantha's grandmother, um, who was basically her caretaker. Her mom and uh, stepdad were off working, and her grandmother, Virginia, took care of her. They reported to the police, and that began one of the best investigations I have probably ever been aware of, and you know, in my tenure as, as a prosecutor. There became just a manhunt, although they didn't know, you know who, the, who it was. So the only witness was little Sarah. Sarah described the man to a police artist and had a sketch drawn, described the car in decent detail for a you know, five-year-old. And so the Orange County Sheriff's Department, which took jurisdiction of the case because the kidnapping was in Stanton and that was under their um, investigation. When a murder took place in, Orange, in the sheriff's territory, their whole homicide team got involved. And they would all work the case, at least initially. I remember that the sheriffs had put out, and I, and I was not involved in the case at this point. I'm just, you know, I'm just anybody just following it, though. I mean, I knew about it. It was on, it was on the news. It was on the papers. You know, and I had some interest in it, again, because there had been these other sort of high-profile kidnappings of children uh, leading up to it. The sheriff's department put out the sketch onto the news. I remember Mike Corona, the sheriff at the time, had held at least, you know, several news conferences, but basically said, you can't run, you can't hide, we're coming for you, we're going to find you. I remember that quote. Oh, yeah, pretty, you know, very confident that they were going to solve this case. So the next day on July 16th, there were some hang gliders who were going up to where the Ortega Highway goes over from Orange County into Riverside. They were up there hang gliding at the top of that mountain. And they saw, they found the, you know, they noticed the body of a, of a young child and they called the police. And of course it turned out that was Samantha. She had been killed. Ultimately it was determined she had been sexually assaulted. She was strangled to death and just left there. I remember it was relatively quick that they got a break in the case. The sheriff's department received a call from a woman who lived out in Lake Elsinore and who said, I saw the picture of or the drawing of somebody on television. I think I know who that is. And she told the sheriffs that one of her children, her daughter, and that she had dated a man and that this man had been accused of molesting her daughter and that there had been a trial in 2001, the year before, where the man, and she she named him as Alejandro Avila, that he had been charged with molestation of three girls, and he had been acquitted. He had jury out in, in uh, Riverside County had found him not guilty. The police began to focus on Avila. And what do you remember and about Avila? He was in his 30s, right? I think ultimately, yeah, I think... I think he actually was in his late 20s at the time of the crime. Okay. I think when the, tr- the, the trial was three years later, and that was, um, I think he was 30 by the time of the trial, so I think it was in his late 20s. You know, ultimately the evidence that the police put together on this case was, under Samantha's fingernails, she had, she had DNA that was not hers. That was linked to Avila. Right. Better than linked, it was a DNA match. As they focused more and more on him, he had given sort of an alibi where he was. Um, he had said he had, he was supposed to leave the fam- The family had said he was supposed to leave to go buy some food for dinner, and he just never showed up till the next day. He said he just wanted some time to think. Had driven to the beach, uh, spent the night in a hotel in uh, Temecula, which which was true, and that was it. Didn't know anything about it. 
uh, the police found that he had actually driven, well, circumstantially had driven to Stanton based on timing, and which is where he did the kidnapping. And the link to that place in Stanton was he had had a girlfriend that had lived there some years earlier who had a, you know, a young daughter. Then he was seen down in a Dana Point San Clemente area on the video cameras uh, at an Arco gas station. And he was seen wearing a pair of shoes that were identified as Nike, I want to call them Defenders, some name like that. And a box was found in his bedroom that was that shoe, but the shoes were never found. Uh, he had told somebody that he had gotten rid of things, had, had ditched things out in the desert somewhere um, at some point, although he never admitted to the crime. So the police, are, they're pretty much sure they, that he's the guy and they were ultimately able to um, get a hold of the car that was his car, and they found Samantha's DNA in the car on the passenger side near the door handle and near that area. That was that was pretty that was pretty much the evidence of the case. So, Dave, it seems like he was pretty sloppy when it came to the the DNA evidence, where he had her DNA. You know, his DNA was on her. Um, there was DNA in his car. There was DNA at the crime scene. What do you make of that, that he didn't try and cover his tracks? I made of that at the time that he, I mean, I think DNA is something now. It's, it's 20 years later, or it's 18 years later. Sure. We, I think we take it, well, I know in the, in the law enforcement community, we completely take it for granted. And we're probably right that most people know about it. But I bet you there's still a lot of people that don't. And back then, there were a lot more people that didn't really know what DNA evidence or what it was and how they would, how they would leave it. You know, he, you've got to remember also, he did not really attempt to hide Samantha's body. He did not attempt to get rid of it. He left it in an area that, you know, it wasn't as obvious as if you'd left your body on Ortega Highway, but it was not that difficult to discover. These hang gliders were not, you know, going through the bushes or the brush. There was some arrogance there that I suspected at the time, and there's nothing that's changed my mind on it, was based on the fact that he had been acquitted of those other three child molestation cases. It also led me to believe that the reason he killed Samantha was because he didn't want a witness to testify him at, at trial. Uh, he had gone through the trial the year before. He had won, in essence. He was not convicted, but he probably didn't like it. And he probably figured that, you know, his family believed he was innocent. I'm sure he convinced them that they stood behind him, but it probably wasn't going to happen again. So he was going to, he made sure this time that he left no witness and that in his mind, I'm guessing, I can't get into his mind, but I'm guessing he felt that since he didn't, there was no witness, there was nothing else that was going to tie him, that he was going to get away with it. Was one of the pieces of evidence her tears in the car? Well, that was, uh, that was my artistic license. Well, this is true of any case, and you know this as well. I mean, you come up with a strategy. I mean, you come up with a strategy of what evidence you're going to put on, and then you come up with what you believe is a reasonable interpretation of that evidence, especially the circumstantial evidence, because that's what the law requires. And so in my mind, I thought that I knew we had, I knew we had DNA in the passenger area of the car. And so I knew we could prove Samantha had been in the car. But I remember thinking, what else does this tell us? Does it tell us anything conclusively? as far as the source of, of the material that the, in which the DNA was found. No, it doesn't. But is it consistent with, what is it consistent with? All right, so what reasonably could I say this is consistent with to a jury without having a judge to tell me that I'm, you know, not talking about evidence? And I knew it was consistent with any fluid from her body. So that could be mucus from her nose or, in my mind, tears. And a much more visual interpretation of that evidence to me was the tears. And so I never said 
never said, I was very careful, I never said that to Samantha's chairs. I always said that that was consistent with, could have been, you know, that, right. that sort of thing. But the impact, people have all, when, it, when people have talked about this case, they always remember that. That thing, that stuck out. It was, you know, it was by design for the jury to stick out, but it, it did end up sticking out, and it's, and it's something that, like I said, I, I will always remember. It worked, because 18 years later, I remembered it. Based on what you knew about Avila, how would you describe him? That's a, actually a really interesting question, because as a prosecutor, you're going to have defendants that commit heinous crimes, and, you know, you can just sort of, in your mind, just sort of say, you know, you're a horrible person, you're evil, you're that, which is very well may be true, and that's as far as your as your interest goes. For me, I've always been kind of interested in sort of what maybe makes these guys tick, and you know, and I know they're they're different things, and everybody's different, but because of that, I always wish I could talk to any defendant I prosecuted, and not necessarily about the crime. I right. just wish I could have you know talked to them, interviewed them found out about them, know more about them. Of course, you can't do that as a prosecutor. What I knew about Avila was really what other people that knew him said about him. You know, how he acted in court, did that, you know, did that give anything? Because I've had very fine defendants, and, you know, you know some things about that. And that. But Avila was not that way. He was very, I never, I never really heard him speak any words. He would confer with defense counsel at court hearings or at the trials. You know, you could hear sort of undertone talking, but Never really heard him say much. He never spoke at sentencing. He never, he did not testify. From people that knew him, he just seemed like sort of a, kind of a milk toast. It was always kind of the way I thought about him, sort of a mild manner, not really very aggressive in his day-to-day -day activities. He did, he never came off as an aggressive person. He never came off as a, um, as a person who, um, you know, he, it just, he, he just never, I never really had a great picture of him. You know, to be honest with you, I just never, I never, I never felt I knew as much about him as I wanted to know. What did it feel um, like to be in court with him every day for five weeks knowing what he did? Well, there was no feeling there. I will remember, you know, going back before, okay, so we're talking about the trials in 2005. So let me go back in my mind to, I started trying homicides in, 19, in 1991. And so let's say 1992, so 10 years earlier. Well, uh, 10 years earlier than the crime, but the, um, 13 years earlier than the murder. I remember the first time I had three defendant case that were three hardened gang members who had killed an innocent young 20-year-old. These guys were so bad, and you felt it. It was the first, like, it was the first multiple defendant case I'd had the baddest defendants I'd ever had. And I just, you know, every day at that trial, I mean, I just really felt something. I really could feel it. <laughs> you <know>? Right. <laughs> and, and there's been other cases like that without I didn't feel anything. My feelings in the Avila case, and so I'm, what I'm saying from him, I didn't feel anything. In the Avila case, I felt a lot. And my feeling in the, in the Avila case was the strong emotion I was feeling coming from Samantha Ryan's mother from Aaron Runyon, the pain that she suffered every time she had to come to court and face this guy who in some ways added her world. I mean, like I said, I had no feelings one way or the other for him. Aaron Runyon told me one time she didn't have any feelings one way or the other for him. I wanted to forget about him. But what he had done to her and what he had done in taking away a life that was so important to her was absolute devastation, and I felt that all the time. Did that feel like pressure? Uh, there is pressure. There was pressure, but good pressure. Pressure I like. You know, we always used to joke in the office we try when we talk about trying cases. You know, that fear was fear was the major motivating factor. I mean, you're just you know you don't want to blow it. Right. Uh, you don't. You don't want to. You know, you don't want to blow it for yourself, and you certainly don't want to blow it for the victims or the victims' families. In Avila, I did not feel that kind of fear. I felt like we had a great case. I felt like I had a solid 
trial strategy. Once it got to the jury selection, I saw I picked a really good jury. I didn't think the defense had a prayer against us. I was very confident, and the only question was going to be how long was it going to take to get a verdict, and how long was it going to take to get a death sentence. I'm pretty cocky, I know, but I don't know about every case. But I felt that way about this case. I tried that. I'll come back to your question, but I mean, I tried that case in three days. My my prosecution, I put all that evidence on three days, and that was it. In my mind, get in, get out, let the defense do whatever they want to do, and get to the jury. I wanted, I wanted just enough evidence so I could argue that case, and I knew that would would be all it was going to take, and that was sort of sort of how I felt. And I remember talking a lot with with Aaron, with Aaron Runyon, sort of about, you know, what the strategy was going to be, why I was going to do the things I was going to do, and what I expected the result to be. So I felt my responsibility, you know, there, you always have a general responsibility to the citizens, you know, to the taxpayers, whatever you want to call it, to the people. You know, you're the, you represent the people of the state of California. But you're going to feel a singular responsibility to the victim if they're alive or the victim's family if they're not. And because I knew how hard this um, senseless murder had hit Aaron Runyon, I, I just didn't, you know, I guess there is, I guess fear is there I, because you, you fear that you don't, you fear letting that person down, that something could go wrong. Even though you don't think it's going to, there's always that chance, of course. You know, in any endeavor involving humans, things can go wrong. But I I just, my motivation was to try to give her some certainty, some finality, and to let her start on a path of being able to forget about this guy. That's what she wanted to forget about this guy. Tracy, why does this impact us this way? Why does this one case impact us? Because it's really affected me for 20 years. I think it impacts us this way because there's nothing in our society more innocent than a child as young as five years old. A child who is doing what we want all kids to do, playing out in front of her home and was lured by the idea of finding or saving a puppy. Just so innocent and just, it's so hard for us to understand the mindset of the man who did this. Well, so many different agencies were at the command post. So many different agencies participated. Everybody showed up wanting to find this little girl. And she had such an impact on the FBI agents. And I can tell you, the FBI office in Los Angeles at the federal building planted a tree for her. And it's not an easy thing for the federal government to plant a tree. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> yes. No, it's not an easy thing at all. And I'll tell you, I remember Pete Brust, who was the special agent in charge. He spent so much time and effort personally in order to plant this tree for this little girl and to put a memorial down for her. And uh, every time I went to lunch, you know, it was th the path to get out to Wilshire Boulevard and I would see that tree and see the memorial and it would really touch me. I mean, I would feel this joyful spirit of this little girl and it would touch me every time I passed by that. And it meant a lot. It shows what I think people don't understand sometimes that trauma and the emotional toll cases like this have on the people that work in them. They never, ever forget. No, especially ones that involve children like this. So next week, we are going to continue our interview with Dave Brent, and we are going to talk to him about the trial itself and what haunted him about this case for all these years. And we are also going to have a very special guest, the mother of Samantha Runyon, Erin Runyon on the show. And Aaron has started a foundation called the Joyful Child Foundation to protect other this from happening to other kids. So um, we're really excited about next week's episode. And until then, please like us on Facebook, Behind the Crime Scene. Subscribe through your favorite podcast provider. Yes, subscribe. We like subscribers. Uh, we're on Twitter at Behind the Crime 2 and on LinkedIn. 
and on Instagram at Behind the Crime Scene. So join us on these social media platforms or even drop us a line on our website at BehindTheCrimeScene.com. We would love to hear your thoughts or comments and we'll see you next time on Behind the Crime Scene. Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne and Tracy Miller is produced and edited by Lisa Osborne. Theme music is Insomnia by retired IRS Special Agent Clarissa Balmaceda. Find us on social media through BehindTheCrimeScene.com. And don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne and Tracy Miller wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Lisa Osborne.